This episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the lip was twisted, the soldier was blanched, and the men were dancing, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever stopped to wonder about whatever happened to Inspector Gregson? Or Mrs. Hudson's husband? Or of Holmes' early clients? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 209, Typography. Hello, hello, and welcome to Trifles. That is the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look at some of the details in the Sherlock Holmes cases. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wilder. Bert, you are a font of knowledge, as always, and we're looking forward to conversing once again. You know, this is the last episode of season four. Can you believe that? No. My goodness. It's incredible. It's incredible. Uh, we, we've done 52 episodes this year, and as we round the corner into 2021, it's a good question. Should we continue with season five? You know, uh, 221 has a nice ring to it in terms of the number of episodes. And at this point, I, I don't know. I feel like we're running out of material. We, we, we seem to have beaten this horse until it's beyond recognition. Um, wow. what do you think? Oh, well, there's so many topics that we haven't covered. For example, bindings. You know, look at the various editions of the cases of Sherlock Holmes. I mean, just if you want to talk about saddle stitching, stapling, glue. You know, for example, one of my favorite things to do is to pull down from the shelf one of my 1890 copies of the memoirs of Sherlock Holmes from the Harper Brothers First American Edition and look at the stitching, you would find that those signatures, you know, for example, a lot of people don't understand how many signatures it really, so we could, we could do five or six or seven <laughs> or 70 shows. Oh, I'm sorry. And just we, signature binding alone. I dozed off there for a minute. Were you saying something? Embossing. I'm talking oh, about embossing. You are the boss of embossing. Uh, Gold leaf, you know. Don't make me hit you with my embosser. Uh, well, look, here's napkins. I mean, Sherlock Holmes and napkins. You know, we haven't talked pocket handkerchiefs. <laughs> Who well, wore, uh, where were, you know, where, which pocket did, did Watson really have a handkerchief in his sleeve? I mean, we could, my God, in fact, look, let's just record the first month of <laughs> season five now. Oh, wow. Um, Toothpaste. I've, what I've got. Favorite brand? I, I have a few things I need to get to before then. Well, look, this is a great opportunity to get some feedback from our <laughs> fans. What, what would you like to hear us talk about in season five? Uh, you know, we, we've covered lots of things. You can go and check out our archives to see exactly all of the episodes that we've covered uh, on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com um, or, or simply scroll through your uh, your podcast catcher and and see what some of those episodes are. Um, but what what ideas do you have? Why don't you send us an email at trifles at I hear of Sherlock dot com uh, or leave us a comment in the show notes of this episode, which can be found at ihose dot co slash trifles two oh nine. Uh, we're always open to hearing from you. And of course, we're on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We are I Hear of Sherlock in all of those places. And by the way, if you don't listen to our interview show, there's an opportunity to tune in and see what we're talking about with other people or between ourselves. In the meantime, let's get going on typography. Well, last episode, we talked about handwriting and how handwriting could uh, perhaps divulge bits of information 
about a personality, about oh things like uh, your travel schedule, or even your age. And Holmes was very discerning in his ability to be able to pick up on those things by looking at just snatches of handwriting. And in this case, I think we'd like to turn to uh, the less personal uh, typeface. Now, of course, there was plenty of typeface happening. We, we know uh, the printing press founded or, or established uh, by uh, Gutenberg in the 1500s. And uh, by this point, by Holmes's time, you know, newsprint was, um, well, as widely circulated as newsprint. Um, and typewriters were even coming into play here. So let's think about and talk about um, typefaces, fonts, and how those helped Holmes in terms of his detection. There's two very prominent cases that I think we can talk about. And um, we'll, we'll cover one now and one after the break. So, Bert, dealer's choice, which would you like to begin with? Well, I think we should probably begin at uh, the um, – why don't we begin in sort of the Baskerville area here? Hmm. And it's it's worth noting that when you think about Sherlock Holmes, and you pointed this out in our last episode – Print really was the form of communication. People were circulating handwritten notes. Telegrams were going back and forth. And we know from the earliest, our earliest encounters with Sherlock Holmes that he's fascinated with newspapers. And in fact, in a way, Holmes functioned with newspapers the same way Google functions with the internet. He brought, the newspapers brought to him information about people, about accounts. We know he kept detailed scrapbooks. He cut out and pasted in clippings. And he would filter and sort and retain this information so that he could use it in his practice later. And uh, that's why in, you know, the earliest moments of The Hound of the Baskervilles, he is able to, um, you know, look at a note and draw some very significant conclusions. Yeah, and as as a reminder, that note was one that was received by Sir Henry Baskerville uh, at uh, the Northumberland Hotel, and it was a um, a half sheet of foolscap paper folded into four, and across the middle of it, a single sentence had been formed in uh, almost ransom note like way, uh, using printed words. Uh, that said, as you value your life or your reason, keep away from the moor. And of course, the word moor was the only word in that phrase that was printed in ink rather than clipped out of uh, some publication. Now, uh, the, the, the question became then, uh, who wrote this and, and where did it come from? And uh, Holmes begins to make some uh, very astute observations about it that uh, are, are, well, enlightening for the rest of us following along. Yes, he does. And um, one of the most interesting things he does, and this is a great Sherlockian moment, you know, where he where he absolutely stuns his audience. He um, takes a look at this, uh, spreads it flat, across the table as you value your life or your reason, keep away from the moor. And um, he says to Watson, uh, you know, uh, uh, I imagine this has been, was put together and posted yesterday evening. Do you have yesterday's times, Watson? And Watson says, yes, it's right here in the corner. Well, Holmes then says, gives, ex- tells Watson exactly where to look. <laughs> look, <laughs> You know, in this particular part of the paper, ah, yes, yes, yes. Here's an article on free trade, and, and he sort of shows this to Watson and Dr. Mortimer, and they're and Sir Henry, and they're sort of all baffled. And then Holmes points out, well, now if you look, you can see that these words have been extracted: your life, reason, value, keep away, and that's just absolutely stunning, you know, to. Uh, to his audience. And so this is another great example of Holmes, you know, having this Sherlockismus moment. Mm. It, it really is perfect. And, and um, you know, how fortunate that uh, the 
the individual on the other end of this um, of this note uh, wasn't using some sort of uh, regional local paper that they had brought with them on the train or something. Uh, they were actually using uh, the Times, which is a very prominent, still is a very prominent newspaper in London. Well, he he, he turns to Doctor Mortimer, who expresses some uh, amazement at this Sherlockismus, as you say. Uh, he said, "Really, Mister Holmes, this exceeds anything which I could have imagined. Uh, I I could understand anyone saying that the words were from a newspaper, but that you should name which." And add that it came from the leading article is really one of the most remarkable things I've ever known. How how did you do it? <laughs> and Holmes says, well, I, I presume, Doctor, that you could tell the skull of a Negro from that of an Eskimo. Well, most certainly. But how? Oh, that's my special hobby. The differences are obvious. A superorbital crest, a facial angle, a maxillary curve, the ah. But this is my special hobby, and the differences are equally obvious. There's as much difference to my eyes between the leaded bourgeois type of a Times article and the slovenly print of an evening half-penny paper as it could be between your Negro, Negro and your Eskimo. The detection of types is one of the most elementary branches of knowledge to the special expert in crime. Though I confess, once, when I was very young, <laughs> I confused the Leeds Mercury with the Western Morning News. But a Times leader is entirely distinctive, and those words could have been taken from nothing else. As it was done yesterday, the strong probability was that we should find those words in yesterday's issue. Yeah, well, and it goes on because, of course, you know, the next thing that happens is, well, Sir Henry says, oh, so far as I can follow you then, Mr. Holmes, someone cut out this message with the scissors. Holmes says, oh, no, nail scissors. <laughs> you could see that it was a very short bladed scissors since the cutter had to take two snips over key. So, you know, he draws that conclusion too. I don't, I do not know how, how, uh, you know, this 19th century statement that you can, um, associate race with the, uh, the the shape of a skull. I you know I don't know if that has had or has any sort of scientific. Well, this would be uh, very much in line with Holmes's uh, use of the pseudoscience of graphology. Uh, <laughs> you know, in 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 terms, of, you know, phrenology. The, the study of skulls was also very much in vogue at the time. So it's not. Um, and, and and recall that Doctor Mortimer, when he first met. Sherlock Holmes, he said that he coveted his skull, right? Yeah. So phrenology seems to be uh, an underlying theme here as a, uh, a popular culture issue. That's true. But also around popular culture, you know, this is, this is one of the lovely things. It just shows you, I hope our reader, our listeners pick up on this, that, um, you know, you dig into these paragraphs, you know, that you can enjoy at the time and just sort of pay attention to them. You find all sorts of interesting things going on. Mm. So, for example, after the nail scissors, um, someone says, have you read anything else in this message, Mr. Holmes? And Holmes says, well, yes. Uh, now, first of all, he says, uh, you know, the Times is the newspaper and the Times is a paper which is seldom found in any hands but those of the highly educated. Mm. <laughs> which is, so we may take it, therefore, that the letter was composed by an educated man who wished to pose as an uneducated one. <laughs> now that is sort of, And then he says, you know, the words are not gummed on in an accurate line. Some are much higher. Though this may point to carelessness or it may point to agitation and hurry. I'm inclined to think about that's the reason this was important. You no, know, I mean, my goodness. Um, and Holmes, Dr. Mortimer says, well, now you're guessing. And Holmes says, ah, well, we're balancing probabilities and choosing the most likely. It is the scientific use of the imagination. But we have always some material basis on which to start our speculation. And then he says... <laughs> I'm almost certain this address had been written in a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. and it's because the pen has spluttered, and so it's an unfamiliar pen, and the pen is run dry and a short address, and there wasn't much ink in the bottle, and, and uh, so. <laughs> but it's real. It's really wonderful. Absolutely wonderful stuff. Indeed. Well, speaking of wonderful stuff, we have this quick message from our sponsor. 
With each passing season brings another passing quarterly issue of the Baker Street Journal. This scholarly journal has been around since 1946 and each year produces four volumes, one for each season, spring, summer, autumn, and winter, and a bonus Christmas annual. That's right, that's five issues every year of the Baker Street Journal, which consists of some of the best Sherlockian scholarship around the world. In each issue, you can read authors, people like yourself from all around the world and all around the Sherlockian societies who write in with their theories on Dr. Watson's bullpup, Sherlock Holmes' proficiency on the violin, the appearance of Mycroft Holmes and Mrs. Hudson, and more. If you can imagine something interesting to write about in the Sherlock Holmes stories, then someone probably will in the Baker Street Journal. Are you subscribed? Get over to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and make sure you are part of the BSJ tradition today. We're back in audio form rather than typewritten form, but we are talking about all things typewritten. Um, There was another case, a case of identity, as a matter of fact, where a typewriter played into the identification of the criminal and the crime. Uh, You recall that uh, uh, Miss Mary Sutherland had uh, come to Holmes uh, due to her her missing fiancé or uh, or intended. Uh, And in this case, it was her stepfather, James Windebank, who was uh, leading a double life, as it were. He was posing as Hosmer Angel, leading Mary Sutherland on to keep her from uh, leaving the household and taking her, uh, her, her allowance with her. And how did he yeah. do that? Well, he disguised himself with whiskers and some uh, tinted glasses. Very clever. Uh, the, almost a Clark Kent uh, disguise. And uh, couldn't uh, be seen as, uh, as as sending notes to her in his own handwriting because, of course, she would have recognized James Windebank's handwriting. So what did he do? He actually used a typewriter. And it was not just any typewriter, but it was the very typewriter that Mary Sutherland used for her her own um, her own work. Yes. Well, that's really amazing. You know, that, uh, I mean, if you just think about that for a second. So his big concern is that his big concern there is that she would recognize his handwriting, not the fact that her stepfather happened to be wearing (laughs) whiskers and tinted glasses. You know, that was, that was, and, you know, uses the same typewriter. The interesting thing, you know, just to close the loop with the prior conversation, type is a big deal in in Victorian time, and it be a big t- big deal in the twentieth century, even and today from a design standpoint. And many people think that Baskerville type, or at least some people think Baskerville type, as an example, came from the Hound of the Baskervilles, because that's obviously a popular way the name is used. But actually, Baskerville type goes back to the eighteenth century and a type designer, and so. The way these, the way type is laid down on paper, the, the fonts on, on typewriters, the spacing, the size of the characters, the shape of the letters, small deformities in all of these things, uh, you know, are, are a big deal, especially to the trained eye. That's a great point. And, you know, for those who are interested in, um, you know, what goes into making a font, there's a wonderful story, and we'll have a, a a link to this in the show notes. We'll just give you the overview of it. The, the The story is the gorgeous typeface that drove men mad and sparked a 100-year mystery. Are you familiar with this story, Bert? Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in brief, it goes back to this time. You know, and you look at the people in the... 19th century who were involved in type and typography and design, William Blake, William Morris, the pre-Raphaelites, everybody. But a particular typeface was um, developed, and, and it's a, it is a remarkable um, font, so, the so-called dove's type. 
and the differences, the the thick lines, the thin lines, the the way lines change and gradation, the size of the capital letters, their relation to the lowercase letters, the spacing. It's just, it is a lovely fun. But um, in brief, to prevent it from falling into the wrong hands, uh, the designer uh, dumped it in the Thames. <laughs> it's, it's really amazing. No one seemed to notice him, the article says. A dark figure who often came to stand at the edge of London's Hammersmith Bridge on nights in 1916. No one seemed to notice either that during his visits he was dropping something into the River Thames, something heavy. Over the course of more than a hundred illicit nightly trips, this man was committing a crime against his partner, a man who owned half of what is being heaved into the Thames, and against himself, the force that had spurred its creation. The venerable figure, founder of the legendary Dove's Press, and the mastermind of its typeface was a man named T.J. Cobden Sanderson, and he was taking a metal type that he had painstakingly overseen and dumping thousands of pounds of it into the river. And from there, uh, the Dove's type was, was lost for a hundred years. Uh, and it was it was only resurrected in the past couple of years. And I'm, I'm trying to remember: was any of it recovered, or was it was it simply digitally uh, manipulated to be able to, uh, to 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 recreate it? Well, my me- my memory, and you know, I can only trust my memory so far. But my memory is, uh, yeah, some of it was recovered. But what the effect of being in the river? Uh, you know, whether or not they recovered whole. There's so much that goes into a font, sizes, spaces, characters, mm. punctuation. Um, it, it literally is thousands of pieces. Whether or not they got a working um, set of type that would be at all useful out of the uh, out of the Thames is, un, is unknown to me. But I do remember, I think, that they did bring up – because that's what started the story. You know, people began to pull this stuff out of the river and said, how'd this get here? Yeah, well, uh, we'll leave it to you to take a look at that article in our show notes. A little homework for you to see exactly what happened, how it was uh, resurrected. And don't forget your homework on sending us an email at trifles at IHearOfSherlock.com about what you would like to hear in 2021, in Season 5 of the show, as we begin it in January. And that is nothing more than a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. You're interested. Indeed.